welcome to the commentary booth where we watch and you guessed it, commentate on the week that was in our movie and TV watching. I'm your host and play-by-play commentator Jamie Apps and each week I'm joined by a rotating cast of colour commentators to help you find your next viewing treat. This week I'm joined by a very special guest. This person is a Walkley award-winning journalist, fellow movie buff and the host of the upcoming SBS investigative documentary series The Mission. Welcome to the show, Mark Fennell. Hey, Jamie. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I'm very excited to check out The Mission coming up on SBS very soon. Thank Um, you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So this week we're doing something a little bit different on the show rather than deep diving into one particular film or TV show that we've watched this week. We're going to chat about Mark's love for movies and TV. And of course, his upcoming show, The Mission. So uh, firstly, Mark, what would you say is your favorite movie of all time? It's funny because I, I was I was a film critic for, for a long time. I think some people might remember I used to be called uh, That Movie Guy on Triple J for about 11 years. And when I was a film critic, I used to get this question a lot. And I realized I actually struggled to answer it because... I feel like movies are a bit like fashion, right? You have like, you get into different moods, right? So there's like, there are days when I just want to watch a big dumb action movie. There are days when I just want to go back and watch something nostalgic. But that being said, there are movies that I find myself going back and rewatching every couple of years. And I feel like the closest I get to a favorite movie is that, right? So there's two that come come up and I think it has less to do with whether or not they're amazing movies. It has more to do with when I saw them. Um, so the first one is Donnie Darko and actually, I'm not sure if you can see this. I've got a Donnie Darko poster over there in the corner of, of, of my room. Uh, and it was passed to me from the, the previous film critic at Triple J, Megan Spencer. And I, one of the reasons why I like Donnie Darko is that it's the, the filmmaker that made it. <laughs> I think it is his one only good film for starters, <laughs> but like, yeah, things went off the rail a little bit after that film, but it's also one of these movies where I think I watched it. I was in high school and it kind of blew my mind because every time you go back and we rewatch it, it can kind of be about something else. Uh, So if you've never seen it before, it's about a young guy, Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, sort of pre-massive fame. Uh, It's set in the 80s. He's quite mentally unwell, but he can also see through time. He gets visited by a demonic bunny rabbit that tells him something bad's about to happen. Uh, It involves a plane crash and time travel and it's just very trippy. But the thing is, every time I go back and watch it, I think it's about something else. Like, is it about mental health? Is it about, uh, is, is it about actually legitimately about time travel? And I think there's something to be said for movies that reveal themselves over time or reveal different aspects of themselves over time because they're not easily digested. The other movie, and it's weird because I, I reckon I probably saw them within a week of each other, is a film called The Insider, which is, uh, it's about a, a whistleblower in the tobacco industry played by Russell Crowe and his relationship with a with a 60 minutes producer played by Al Pacino. And I think it's interesting. I I remember when I was in sort of year nine at school, I I was just like, that's it. I'm going to go see every movie nominated for an Oscar. I don't know why. Like it was the summer. You like, you do stupid stuff like that. Right. Actually it wasn't stupid. It was great. It was like the best. Uh, And I I saw that every year. Right. It's great. And I actually, it's funny now because I don't get to see as many, well, at all as much as I used to. And it's kind of weird given what I used to do for a job. Um, but this time I remember I went to like a cinema in the city that was empty. You know, when you have those movies, you're like, there's no one there. It's just yep. you. I think I went to see it with like one other friend or two other friends. And I sat there in the middle and it's really long. <laughs> it's a really long movie, but it's an incredible performance. And also the way it was filmed, it was, you know, it was a lot of handheld cinematography kind of, and bef- I think it, it sometimes handheld cinematography feels like a bit of an aff- affectation, right? It's like they're just put, sort of putting it on to make you kind of feel like it's urgent. This actually does genuinely feel urgent. Every shot feels urgent. Every, every cut feels like it has to cut there and there's nowhere else you can cut it. There is something about the, the sense of purpose behind this film. And it is one of Russell Crowe's like, and actually Al Pacino's best performances, I think. Uh, now, is it necessarily like the best movie ever made? I, I, I don't know. It's sort of eye, beho- eye of the beholder territory, but it cut through to me at that time. Like it really cut straight through to me. Both films absolutely cut straight through to me at the time. And, you know, movies that like that, they stick with you and they never quite let you go. So those are the two that I I always come back to. Yeah, that's fair. I think 
Yeah, that question of favorite movie is very different from what do you think is the best movie, which yes. I think a lot of people kind of get stuck on. They go, oh, my favorite movie has to be what I think is the best movie, and that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, it's like a lot of people were like, Godfather or is Citizen Kane? I've never seen it, but I think it's, I keep being told it's the best. I'm like, no, 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 it's a personal thing. Yeah, yeah, and if, if there's a movie that you just continually go back to, I think that says a lot about it having an impact on you as well. Right. Yes, definitely. And then if we shift over to TV shows, what mm. would you say are some of your favorite TV shows? You have to promise not to laugh at me, Jamie. Uh, I was raised on Star Trek um, as a kid. So I, even though I would never claim it to be the greatest set of television programs in the world, I have a soft spot for like all of it, even the bad stuff. And there is a lot of bad Star Trek, let's be honest. Um, I think there's something to be, uh, again, it's literally like part of the fabric of my childhood. So it's almost like I, I couldn't say anything else, even if I wanted to. Um, what I would say about like the, the kind of the broad overreaching world of, of Trek on TV is when it's bad, it's horrendous. Like it's really atrocious. But when it's good, it kind of demonstrates how science fiction and kind of any kind of genre storytelling is still an incredible platform to kind of execute conversations about big ideas about you know ethics and justice and you know i think i, I do think star trek is generally at its best when it's like, like challenging as a morality play um that's like that's the one the sort of and i, and I know it's cheating a little bit because it's like 11 million different shows um but i kind of consider them all part of the same universe um, so that like, that's the like all time ride or die franchise for me, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yep. Uh, but at the, at the moment I've sort of, um, at the moment I just, I literally last night, I just finished sex education and, uh, I sort of, there's, <laughs> we're at a weird point right now that I genuinely think there is too much TV and I appreciate oh, the irony of that. Yeah. Like I kind of appreciate the irony of that given I make TV for a living and I've got like five shows. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm the problem, but I do feel like it's hard to keep track. Like I've been meaning to sit down and watch season two of Heartbreaker and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that I've just like, I, I will get to it. And it's actually just impossible to keep track. And I, you sort of do end up having to lean on people to kind of sort through the wheat from chaff for you because there's more TV, there's more TV than there was movies when I was a film critic. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's so much and it's a bigger commitment. Um, and I always used to be like, oh, I'll only give a, I'll give a throw, show three episodes before I decide if it's good or not. And I would do that with most new sort of shows. That's actually like physically impossible to do that now. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So, so on a favorite level, right? Like it's the Star Trek universe because of what it means to me on a, uh, what am I watching at the moment level? Oh God. I mean, that's there's just too many that was a very like erudite response from me <laughs> sounds like a muppet um yeah i mean i yeah i just finished sex education last night so i actually thought that was a really beautiful ending and actually this was an interesting year for like shows ending there was a lot of like big emotional show ending things this year like ted lasso and stuff like that which is one of those weird shows where I don't think anyone expected to love Ted Lasso when they started watching it. Like no one no. was like this weird show about an American coach in England sounds trashy as hell. And then suddenly every, <laughs> there was a, suddenly everyone was like, why do I care so much about these people? How did that happen? Uh, and yeah, I think it was and it, way and, more heartfelt than it needed to be. It was like, well, oh, hang on. totally. And then by the end of it, you're like, I'm going to miss these people. And I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Um, so there's been a, quite a bit of that at the moment, uh, for, for shows that it's weird actually with sex education, cause it's been so long since the last season. Uh, and I'm, I am thinking a little bit ahead as to how I'm going to feel about the end of shows like stranger things and, and stuff like that, where I think with also shows with young people where you do feel like they, you kind of grow up with them a little bit. I actually, mm -hmm. I find them it's going to sound so lame, Jamie, but I feel like they are quite hard to let go of because you do feel like you've watched these kids grow up. I think. Stranger Things will be one for that when that finally ends. It'll feel like a big, like, oh, they're going to go off into the world and I'll never see them again, except for the 14 other films they're all attached to in the next 12 months. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's my very roundabout answer to that question. 
Yeah, it's like the uh, the Harry Potter films yes. when when all of those kids were like, okay, we're we're adults now, and it's time to leave. It's like, hang on. Yeah, I'm not prepared for this because I, I mean that was perfect. Like that with the ending of the Harry Potter franchise. And I never read the books, right? So, because I always watched the movies because I knew I was going to have to because I was a movie reviewer and I had to do that. And I, w- there was something about, I, I did liken it once to being like, like Christmas where, you, you know, it's like your family you see once a year, except like with the Harry Potter universe, you don't have to drink to be around them. So <laughs> letting go of that after whatever it was, like seven, eight years was, felt like quite cathartic. I thought I didn't expect I didn't expect to care as much about the letting go of the Harry Potter family because I was never one of those big like Harry Potter fans, but somehow you couldn't help but not feel like they were part of your life because you kept on seeing them like once a year for (laughs) almost a decade. You know what I mean? So it was quite a big commitment in a way. And yeah, you mentioned sort of there just being a glut of TV shows. I think like with the streaming services, that's a really big issue. Like Netflix alone, I think it's impossible to keep up with. Yeah, man, it's also, it's also they, hard they to find. Out. Like, I think through that is also makes it harder to choose, right? And I think, you know, I actually was talking about this with my wife the other day. It's like, hold on, which of the services do we actually watch the most? And and which of the services has shows that we genuinely love the most? And oddly, I, I came down on Apple TV because I actually think Apple TV, even though it doesn't have the biggest collection of stuff, right? It's the stuff that I felt most hooked to. And then after that, it was Disney, <laughs> And then after that, it was Netflix. You know what I mean? Like, it was sort of like, if we were to organize these, and I think because Netflix own, you know, because Netflix really had like, created the market in a way, there's a, temp- there's a temptation to just kind of lump them in. But I was looking at the, the shows I genuinely watch, and I was like, okay, Heartbreak Eye was great. And then there wasn't a lot else that I, and I'm not saying they don't have other great shows. I may well have missed these other great shows, but there wasn't a lot else that I'd watched and gone, I'm, I'm quite committed to you. Uh, a lot of the ones on Stan have come through like Showtime, like The Great. I was obsessed with The Great. Um, just incredible writing, um, really wonderful performances, very funny. Uh, but uh, And also, as it turns out, their final season as well, uh, they found out afterwards. So, I yeah, I, I actually think for me of the streaming services, Apple's probably the one that I think uh, is is has got, the I guess, the, the greatest strike rate for me. Yep, Apple's my personal favorite as well, just because of yeah that that uh, bang for your buck. I think right. they're like the cheapest subscription, and all their shows are really high quality. So I'm happy with Apple. Totally. So now, as we turn our focus to the mission, which is going to be on over air SBS as well as the SBS on demand platform, do you want to just give our audience a brief little rundown as to what the series is about? Yeah, uh, I make weird documentaries, <laughs> I've realised. Uh, so this is an art heist caper. Um, so back in 1986, two not particularly good criminals uh, broke into one of the weirdest places I've ever heard of. So in the middle of the West Australian sort of wheat belt, if you, if you kind of drive around the, the highways, eventually you will come across a 200-year-old Spanish monastery built by exiled monks. Uh, and it, it's like stepping into another time. If you've never been there before, it's it's like, why is this thing here? Not only why is this thing here, it had what was thought to be millions of dollars worth of religious art in there. And in the mid-1980s, these two not very good criminals broke in and slashed the art out of the frames. And they had a plan, which was to smuggle the art overseas. And then after that, everything goes horribly, horribly wrong. It's like one disaster after another for them. And I, I've i covered a lot of, um, you know, art theft, art crime over the years. I did a show for the, I do a show for the ABC called Stuff the British Stole. And we did a um, another film about a stolen Picasso in Melbourne a couple of years ago for, uh, for SBS. And uh, it was actually during making that that somebody mentioned to Corin Grant, the writer and director of, of The Mission, Hey, you know, look, what happened in Victoria was weird, but what happened in WA was way weirder. And at that point, he <laughs> starts telling us about this thing. We're like, what is going on? And I often think, like, when you come, like, because I make lots of podcasts and documentaries and stuff like that, I often think when you when you hear somebody say something and your first reaction is like, what are you talking about? 
that's the moment to bottle it. And we kind of did at that point. So what starts in the West Australian bush ends up taking me all the way to New York and London and the streets of Manila through palaces. It's uh, it, it, the tendrils of this one crime end up reaching all around the globe. And it's the strange, like, I tell you this, like uh, having made bits and pieces like this in the past, normally when you find something with like a, a weird one line idea, it starts weird and then it gradually gets more normal. Like, oh yeah, they did that because of that reason. Oh yeah, they did that because of that reason. This is a really unique one in the sense that it starts weird and it just gets weirder. And I think the big thing is when we came when we found the uh, the police trans uh, interrogation transcripts, and Corin, you know, s- spent all this time finding them, and once he got them, he made he made me this big folder, and I was reading them, and Jamie it read like dialogue. This is the, these are the interactions between the the cops and the crims when they got caught, right? Spoiler alert. And uh, it, it read like dialogue, and at that point, we were like, okay, well, we we'll need to go. We, we're going to have to bring this life. And we hired so. It, we we hired actors and it's it's uh it's been brought to life almost as a docudrama so it's 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 a, a little bit documentary but it's also quite a bit drama at the same time and it's sort of a, a melding of the two uh and it's three episodes uh we really do make it for streaming we really do make it so people binge it all in one go on sbs on demand uh but yes it will also air over three weeks on on the on the oldie television um but it's it's wild like it's genuinely one of the weirdest <laughs> stories I've ever come across. And it ha- has these really bizarre twists and turns that were shocking to us, were shocking to us to, to, um, uh, to kind of piece together. But then it was about capturing that sense of weirdness for the audience as well. It sounds like it's one of those life is stranger than fiction. Like you couldn't have written this to be any weirder if you tried. Really couldn't have. Like, and actually to the point where somebody was like, oh, somebody should make a comedy or a drama out of this. And I'm like, yeah, I think they should too, but I'm not sure anyone would believe it. Like part of what makes stories like this amazing, at least for me, is the fact that they're real. Like this actually happened. And, and there were all of these unanswered questions, even though like from uh, the police and the law standpoint, the, 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 the case was all wrapped up. And actually we start, once we started sort of scratching at it, we we're like, actually... There's a whole bunch of weird unanswered questions here that have never really been dealt with. And so I think part of, I guess initially it was fun and then eventually it gets quite dark. But initially the the fun part was like, hold on, there's so much more here that's never really been put together. And I think that was that's the fun of making this kind of stuff, of working out what what are the missing pieces. And then, of course, there's a there's a very dark crime that it all leads up to. Okay. And was it just that, that weirdness, was that the factor that made you go, I need to dive deeper into this and discover more about it? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a bit strange this way. And Corin is too. Uh, oh, Corin, sorry if Corin's listened to this. I don't think you're strange. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think when you have, when you come across an idea that gives you that, that sort of reaction where you're like, how is that real? That's usually a good sign that it's worth following up on. That's usually a good sign. Uh, many years ago, I used to work for um, the sort of the very famous TV interviewer, Andrew Denton, and he used to measure the success of his shows based on what he calls, um, pardon me, for, pardon the French for swearing, right? He used to measure success of shows, what he calls fuck me moments, which is how many times in an episode people would lean in and go, fuck me, is that real? And actually, uh, Will Anderson, who does... Gruen, uh, the Gruen series, he kind of, I know that team measured the success of Gruen by how many times you can lean and go, fuck me, is that real? And I've always kind of, I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind ever since working for Andrew. It's like, if you have that moment, you need to make sure you capture it for an audience. Okay. Have there been any sort of stories that you've come across and then done some digging and been like, okay, it's not as strange as it initially felt? All the time. All the time. <laughs> And I think part of doing these sorts of things, these sorts of jobs is chucking a lot of stuff at the wall and going down a lot of pathways that lead nowhere. And at the end of the day, the, the audience don't know because it never gets made. Uh, but you kind of have to do that in order to work out if something's worthwhile. You have to do, um, you have to do that, that uh, to, um, to just work out what's the story worth telling. Is that disappointing when you put in some of that work to find, oh, this might be a cool story, and then two or three months down the line it ends up being nothing? Uh, well, the, the trick is to never only be working on one thing at a time, right? So um, in television and in 
podcast land, there's a lot of things that don't get up, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that don't, that, that don't get made for one reason or other, not because it's necessarily bad, but because of, you know, there's not money for it or whatever, like the whole host of reasons. What I learned when I was really young and I got involved in television really young. So my first job was, I was hired when I was 18, I think. Right. So I've, I've been, I've sort of grown up in front of cameras and studios and, and whatnot. And what I learned is quite early is that um, shows get axed, shows don't get made. It's not always about you. It's often about other things. Sometimes it is about you and you should learn from that. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. And if you are only, if you fixate your entire energy on one thing that you're working on and for whatever reason that doesn't get up, you have basically palmed your self-esteem off to the universe that has no, like you have no control over it and it's dangerous. So my solution to that over the sort of the last <laughs> two decades has basically been just work on lots of different things at once. And then when things get up and they work and that's great. And if yeah, they get up and they're not, and they, and they don't work, that's also okay. Cause you've got other things to work on. It, it's a way of keeping yourself continually. So at any one moment, I have something that I'm either shooting or something that's in post or something that, you know, we're pre preparing for the next year or whatever it is. I like to stay in that loop because ideas also cross pollinate, right? So, you know, the, you know, the watching sitting in the sound mixes for one show actually will inspire something for a shoot that I'm organ that we're working on for the next couple of weeks. It, it, it kind of keeps you alive a little bit. Um, do I sleep very much? No, but it does keep me like creatively engaged. And I guess in the world of TV, there's also that idea of like remaining relevant too. Like if you're focusing on one show for six months and then it goes nowhere, you're now off TV for up to a year and it's like, okay, what's, what's Mark done for me recently? Yeah, exactly. Why is my tax dollars going to this guy? Uh, it's not, it's not all your tax dollars. It's like your tax dollars and a lot of ancestry.com dollars, but, um, just in, it's an SBS joke. Um, but I think, uh. Yeah, like I, 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 if anything, this year I've probably put out more than I should have because I, I worry about people just getting a bit, and, and totally fair, fair, like just getting a bit sick of me being like, oh, you got another thing. Why do I? And so I think it's it's quite important to make sure that when you do bring out something new, whether it is a, you know, a, a new TV series or a documentary or whatever, it like it's got to feel like there's a reason for this to exist. Like, why this, why now, and why would I bother following Mark into this world uh, are all questions that you sort of need to answer. And then in terms of the mission, when did you first embark on this investigation and how long in total were you working on it? Uh, that's a great question. I think the, uh, we talked, Corinne and I talked about it when we were finishing, just after we finished Framed, right? So Framed launched on Boxing Day 2021. I spent a big chunk of 2022 making, um, making stuff, the British style for the ABC. And that was, you know, big international thing that took me everywhere. Um, and I think that was, I think it was to midway through 2022, we decided to set up the, the documentary unit at SBS. So that that's a, a dedicated team of sort of six of us who, who are making these documentaries. And we basically embarked on making two at once. Uh, one was a film called the kingdom that came out June last year, uh, June this year. Uh, and then the mission is coming out now. So we were in this weird position where we're filming two films at the same time. Uh, and I think the mission probably benefited somewhat from a slightly longer gestation period. Cause we were definitely, we were quite, I think we were quite sure we were going to do it from about September, October last year. Um, I don't think we didn't really start filming I suppose funny. Actually, I literally started filming both documentaries the day Stuff the British Style went to air on the ABC, which was November last year. So it gives you a it actually gives you a sense of that that overlap, right? So you know, I'm starting to film something that's going to come out in you know October 2023 on the same day that something launches on uh, on the ABC. So I I do like you know even right now we're in sort of um, you know this is the mission's getting set to come out. I've just finished filming season two of Stuff the British Style, and we're just planning the next SBS doco. So they're always sort of overlapping a little bit. Um, <laughs> does it mean I don't quite know where I am mentally at any one given moment? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But I like that the that the ideas can cross pollinate each other. And I also like I'm I'm really choosing. We're really chasing stories that are very different. Like I'm not going to do you know another art crime documentary immediately like there's some we'll do something totally different and totally totally unusual because i think it's time to try something different 
Very nice. So then not to give too much away, but what was sort of the biggest thing that came as a shock to you during the research process for the mission? Uh, I didn't realize the reason the mission was built in the first place. And that's where things go in the last episode. And that's a very dark chapter in the history of, well, actually in the history of Australia, really, and, and the NWA. Uh, yeah, the, I, I should have known, actually, now that I think about it. But I kind of didn't ever process why the place was built in the first place and, and what they what their intentions were with it. And I'll just say, without giving too much weight, it is home. At a certain point, I actually wanted to call the series The Many Crimes of New Norcia because what you have with that place is layer upon layer of crimes. And some of the crimes are comical, downright farcical, like the the theft of the artwork. Um, you know, parts of that that theft are are actually genuinely quite funny. But then there's layers of, of, of crimes. And as you get deeper into the layers of those crimes, you find some stuff that is genuinely evil. And that was probably the part that I wasn't, it's not the case I wasn't fully prepared for, but I don't think you ever quite can be fully prepared for it, but it definitely um, packed a punch. Is that something that you then sort of have to sort of work through after discovering it all and being in the physically in the location physically in the location was odd i gotta say so when we got there i um my first visit to the monastery was sort of around about this time last year like maybe a little bit later sort of november so it's hot and dry and i just come from a month working in america uh on something for bbc and it was where it was freezing and i <laughs> and i you know, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a shock system. So I got back and hugged my children and then flew over to WA. And before we shot anything, because obviously there's heaps of shots of me just wandering around looking mysterious, which is an important part of most of my shows, I'm realizing. <laughs> a lot of Mark running around looking. Hmm. Um, I did notice they that just, in the, the promotional photos. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, wait till you see season two of Stop the British Doll. Um, it's just Mark looking mysteriously. The, we've, we've given it a term when we go film. We call it Mystery Mark. Um, but anyway, I, we got there. Before we filmed anything, Corin, who had spent you know a lot of time there kind of researching it, and he's from WA, lives in WA, he's like, just go and get a feel for the place. And, I, and it was re I'm so glad he told me to do that because he was so right. I... Um, I got in there and I, it was empty. There was no one there. I just wandered around. I went to go th see the art gallery, which is beautiful. Like I have to say, like the, the, the art is there. I'm not a big painting person. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, I'm not a big painting person, but uh, it is beautiful. Like the painting is lovely and it's sort of the, the way it captures light and color is, is noticeable. It is, it is incredible work, but it was desolate and, uh, you do feel, you do feel when you're walking around there that you're stepping onto a part of, onto part of history, like things happened here. And at that point I knew enough about the story that I, I kind of understood what I was walking on, but to actually be there, to actually feel it, to actually kind of step through it is surreal, I must say. So yeah, it is different to be there. That's for sure. And then with the mission being your third investigative series for SBS following framed and the kingdom, are you looking to do a lot more of this in the future? You mentioned sort of establishing that documentary department. So I imagine there's quite a few in, in, the, in the works. Yeah. I mean, we, we try a lot of different things. Um, we, 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 we sort of chase down a lot of different ideas. Um, I think the main thing was to find something that felt really different um, from the mission and the kingdom. So we've got something that we're starting to work on now that I think stylistically and narratively will be quite different. Um, and then I think we always keep a bunch of open threads. There's a bunch of stories that, you know, we've been sort of looking at as a team for the last couple of years and gone one day, one day, the moment will be right to tell that story. The, the right person and talent will become available. Um, but not today. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, like I think, yeah, like I think you have to keep some of those threads open because sometimes projects don't just magically come ready. You've got to just needle away at them for a couple of years. Like it's funny, I had a meeting the other day and I, I brought up, we were talking about ideas and I, 
I ended up bringing up a project that I developed back in 2016 that never went anywhere. And I was, and I was looking at it again and just being like, oh shit, maybe you're ready. <laughs> like maybe you're ready to, to exist. And that happens all the time. That's why like whenever I have an idea for something, I just write it down. As soon as I've written it, I, I, like commit like half a page to a page to, um, so that it, you can kind of bottle the feeling there and then. And then, you know, mate, if it's ready to go, then it's ready to go and the stars are aligned. If it's not, just keep it and go back and look at it every couple of years and go, what could you be? Like, are, are you a book? Are you a podcast? Are you a TV show? What are you? What, 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 do, what do you want to be? And I think I quite like that process of going back and doing a bit of an idea audit of, oh, what about you? What about you? So, I, yeah, like, I think it's good to kind of keep track of, of your ideas when, when you come up with them. Partially because it'll be, you'll, I've got the memory, of, you know, I have no memory, so I have to write things down. Yeah, and I guess that's always good to have that there. Like if, if new information comes up, you can just jot it down in yeah. there and then revisit it later. Totally. And do you look at any sort of other documentary series for like inspiration or ideas on how to perhaps produce yours in a slightly different way? Um, I do. <laughs> this is going to sound really bad. I watched the beginning of a lot of documentaries. Um, it is hard to watch. I wonder how drama people feel about this actually, because I, I do feel like it's harder to watch documentaries and podcasts when you know how they're made a little bit. Like I watch, you know, I, I watched something the other day and all I did was count the setups like how many camera setups they needed for to, to shoot that. And I was doing this thing and it's, you know, you, I think, you know, you've been sort of doing it possibly too long when you watch a film and, and you're just like three camera setup, fake light. That's clever. <laughs> that, you know, you like, you do, and I, it's not that they're necessarily badly, like, cause it, on one level, that is a marker that it's badly made because I'm not engaged. I'm not suspending disbelief, but on another level, it's also just, I'm, I'm watching with a work brain on. Which is good, like, which is, you know, like, it's not bad. I don't, I don't have, like, I don't feel like I've lost anything. And it doesn't affect my watching of drama or comedy, right? So I can still completely suspend disbelief. It's, you know, drama and comedy is sufficiently magical to me that I don't, like, you know, I can watch something and go, ah, every single shot, every single internal shot here has been, they use a hazer. Or, um, you know, like, I do notice lighting and framing and stuff like that. But it doesn't ever, ta it doesn't really take me out. Whereas documentaries I watch, and I think it's going to sound bad. I watch a lot of stuff from overseas, which has been lauded. And I look at it and go, ah, so they paid this one amazing talent. And that's where this idea came from. And then they've kind of wrapped a bunch of talent around them to kind of pad it out for five episodes. Like you can kind of, the, your brain starts going, how did this get made? Oh yeah, because of that person. That's why it got made. Great. And so there's, you, you do things like that where you sort of like, the lot of the mystery is gone and it becomes pure me me mechanics. Okay. Did you sort of have that similar issue when you were the movie guy? Like you were going into films no. and watching them that No, way? I didn't. No. And actually this is a really important point. I think the worst film critics are frustrated filmmakers. And I wasn't then. Like I was just a movie, I was just a film reviewer. Like I... I I grew up on TV, but I grew up on TV as a, like, as a film critic, right? So I was only ever on TV to kind of talk about movies and stuff like that. And I didn't, and, and like, and drama and comedy have are still retained their magic for me. So I don't, I don't get stuck in that mode. Um, no, and I, and I had a real, as a film critic, I had real issues when they hired sort of frustrated filmmakers to review movies because what happens, and I know this because this is where I'm at right now, is that you watch every film through the prism of how would I have done that? which is actually not the right way to watch a movie if you're reviewing it for the public. Like as you're reviewing a movie for the public, um, if you're reviewing a movie for the public, um, you should basically just be an audience member with a microphone. Like you should just be like, I've just, I'm just the, uh, the audience. The, my approach to reviewing movies when I was at Triple J in particular was like, I'm your best mate. I've just seen it a week before you, before you go see it, this is what you're in for. It was no more or less than that. And obviously, you know, you could talk about like big ideas and critical ideas, but you always have to kind of keep it in the realm of, okay, so I've seen this. And I think the thing you need to know before you go see it is this, 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 and this. I think they set out to do this, 
It doesn't quite work, but I'll tell you what does work. This does work. Like it was a bit like just keep it in the realm of conversation because it's radio and, and, and it's, you want to feel like it's a friend. And you, or I think it was about kind of keeping it in, in that zone. You can still talk about big ideas. You can still talk about, you know, bring your critical faculties, but you kind of keep it in the realm of like, it's a conversation. And I think, um, you know, the job of a movie reviewer is to be, is to, you know, still pull things apart, still pull out the big ideas. This, this is not about dumbing it down, but what it is about is kind of recognizing that you're not terribly privileged. Um, you are just a person watching it slightly before the audience and you're arming them with what information they need to know in order for them, for them to sit down and watch it. When frustrated filmmakers review movies, like I said, what, what happens is you're like, Oh, look, I like that setup. I really thought that was quite clever, but I think the narratively, you know, the, that part didn't work. Like you kind of get into the weeds. It's actually, that's great. If you're talking to other filmmakers or other creators, it's fantastic. If you're doing that, it's not as helpful for actual viewers. Those mm -hmm. things should exist. Those conversations should exist. But in the context where I was talking to people, it wasn't that helpful. Yeah. I would say that your reviews definitely inspired the way I go about movie reviews these days it's more I try to look at it as this is the conversation I would have with my friend if we went and saw a movie together and then as we we're going like yes. driving home that's the conversation we're having that's the vibe right like that is exactly like, that's what I was going for like I think I think also it's about with Triple J in particular like nobody was seeking me out like uh, my reviews were sort of sandwiched in between like DMAs and Hilltop Hoods, right? So <laughs> you come to Dribble J for the music and then suddenly there's annoying guys telling you about a movie. And it's a bit like that, that means I'm not wanted, right? And what that means is I have to work extra hard to justify why you would listen to me at all. And that was really good. I think, you know, I spent 90% of my time thinking about what the opening line was going to be. Uh, and I, it's funny, I look back at it now and I like, I think, God, those reviews would have been perfect for TikTok had it existed back then because <laughs> it's like even the way i structure it's like say something outlandish and then you kind of roll back and explain what you actually mean by the outlandish thing and then loop it back at the end i was like it's very like it was structurally it was very tiktok before tiktok was a thing um and so yeah i i but it always had to be i i what i would say to people is imagine you're talking to a slightly drunk mate at the pub and the reason I say that is because when you're talking to somebody in a, an environment that's loud and distracting and they're not necessarily interested in you, you essentialize. You're going to go, you say something, you know, that you, is going to grab attention uh, and then you kind of maintain the conversation as though you're in that register. Because nobody, like, no, even with your podcast, like somebody's chosen to click on you, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody has gone, I'm going to listen. Like there's an, there's, whereas when, on things like Triple J, like there wasn't even that. Like you, you were sort of, foisted upon people and i think you sort of it was good to recognize that in the moment perfect so yeah in closing thank you for joining me on the show this week mark why don't you just go ahead and plug away your socials and sort of let people know when and where they can watch the mission uh so the mission uh, launches on october 24 um you can stream the whole thing for free on sbs on demand uh, and I'm just at Mark Fennell on just about everything, Instagram, <laughs> TikTok, uh, Twitter, all the rest of it. So I'm, that's how you can tell I'm all, like an aging millennial because all my accounts still have my actual real name. <laughs> I was got in early enough. Uh, oh, God, now you make me feel old too, because all mine are the same. <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome to the aging millennial club. <laughs> awesome. Alrighty. Thank you everyone for listening to the commentary booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review and subscribe on podcast services and on YouTube. You can follow me on social media at Jamie Ups Media and at Paria Magazine. As we said, you can follow Mark at Mark Fennell. Thank you again for jumping on the show and good luck with the mission and we look forward to future documentaries. Thanks, Jamie. The commentary booth is a fan-funded production of Jamie Ups Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Perio Magazine, on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash jammyappsmedia. The following people support it at the publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. <laughs>